Hi, and welcome to my review of the BenQ GW2760HS monitor. Now, if you on purpose clicked on this review hoping for a full and detailed review of a monitor that came out in 2013, this video review may disappoint you, because I won't be going into all the detail that I did for my previous reviews. Better to check the text review on ApertureGrill.com. But I suspect most of you have seen my previous reviews and are wondering what I'm doing with this BenQ. Those reviews have been either of TN or IPS panels, which means that I'm missing a big category of monitors, the VA panels. While this BenQ isn't one of the newest high refresh panels, it does exhibit many of the properties typical of VA panels, and I'd love to present some of my measurements and comparisons with the ASUS and LG monitors I've done in the past. And if you liked my previous videos, you may be one of those weirdos who actually like charts and graphs. So let's get started. The BenQ GW2760HS is a 27-inch Full HD VA monitor, and it can be, with some futzing with front porch and sync width settings, overclocked to 80Hz, which is a pretty nice bump up from 60. I'm going to skip talking about the stand, whether or not it has speakers, it does, and the display inputs, well, except for the fact that it has a VGA input, which is pretty cool. But I want to get right into the brightness and contrast. New for this review, I've separated out the brightness and contrast measurements, and I've changed the y-axis now to a log scale. This in part because the BenQ at around 3001 is dramatically better than both the LG TN and Asus IPS displays, which clock in at 950 to 1 and 1100 to 1 respectively. This contrast bump is really the only reason you'd opt for a VA panel, and it is really good. Once you pass 3000 to 1, and especially as you get up towards modern VA TVs with their 5000 to 1 ratios, images have a depth and clarity missing from IPS and TN. But like every monitor technology, they have downsides. No perfect displays yet. But I'll start with a compliment. The anti-glare coating is really good. Looking at these super macro photos of the coating, the BenQ has a light and thin film that doesn't cause much rainbow speckling with white backgrounds. I praised the VG27AQ's coating in the last review, but this is better and it's a huge improvement over the LG TN, and especially that old Dell. But, looking now at the pixel structure, and especially the image I have under text rendering, you may have noticed that this VA panel, much like many modern VA panels, have a split subpixel. For full bright pixels, the entire subpixel is lit, but as the pixel dims to half brightness, only the bottom half of the subpixel dims. Then, from 50% to black, the top half dims. The last picture is a super macro of the Edit Color Swatch from Microsoft Paint, and it offers a good illustration of the problem with this type of pixel arrangement. As we near the bottom, with only half the subpixels lit, there are now large horizontal gaps between pixel rows. Even though the screen has a good anti-glare coating, the limited pixel fill makes the screen look somehow lower resolution than it actually is. The same thing occurs on a lot of modern high refresh VA panels, and you'll see it in almost every curved VA panel made by Samsung. I don't currently have one to photograph, but PCMonitors.info has great macro shots of this. Check out the review of the AOC AG273QCX, or just search r slash monitors for VA blurry text. The Asus looks much cleaner in comparison. For viewing angles, VA panels are better than TN, but worse than IPS. Watch as the TN and VA panels rotate. The TN takes on a yellowish hue, while the VA goes a little bit pink. The Asus, with its IPS panel, maintains the same colors, but just darkens as the viewing angle increases. The CRT is, of course, unmatched. But this comparison doesn't highlight one of my biggest issues with VA panels, which is the viewing angle-dependent gamma shift of dark values. This is a video of the BenQ displaying a 5% gray slide while I move the camera around. VA panels crush dark grays in a nice circle centered right on your viewing angle, and this circle follows you around whenever you move your head. I find this way more distracting than TN panels, which are at least consistently bad across the whole screen. Image editing on a VA is a nightmare. The GW2760HS is pretty splotchy across the entire screen, but I really only want to highlight here the 5% shots. These were taken at 2 meters away, but you can still see that darkened inner circle, which gets worse as you get closer. You may be less annoyed by this than me, but even more than slow pixel transitions, which I'll get to shortly, this viewing angle issue is my biggest problem with VA panels. Getting on to the pixel transitions, let's first take a look at the various overdrive settings offered by BenQ. The OSD has only three, off, high, and premium. Looking at pursuit photos of our friendly Blurbuster alien here, there doesn't seem to be much difference between off and high, and measurements bear that out. 
My CAD score for off is only around 11% worse than high, but it's definitely worse, so I'm only going to be comparing high and premium from here on out. If you look at high and premium, which would you prefer? Your eyes may be drawn to the bluish inverse ghosting on the premium slides, or you may notice that on the darker background, premium has less trailing than high behind the red craft, but more behind his cockpit. Most of you are probably leaning towards high, but maybe I can convince you otherwise. Let's take a big picture overview of the two settings. On the left, I have the cumulative absolute deviation, real response, and first response of the high setting. And on the right, the same three things, but with overdrive set to premium. The standout here is the first response for premium. These look pretty good compared to the sea of red we see everywhere else. When I first made the scales on these charts, I didn't anticipate such bad responses. That's why almost every transition is off the charts, but I'll fix that in a moment. Take a look though at the mean CAD scores for both. 430 for high, 375 for premium. Premium is performing better than high overall, even though it has some insane transitions. Let's look in detail at one particular transition where premium actually beats high, RGB 95 to 159 and back. The slide I'm showing now has the rise and fall waveforms and the first response charts for each. Starting with overdrive high, this is a long, slow rise. It looks like the curve only hits its target level at about 50 milliseconds. And looking at the chart, the rise from 95 to 159 does indeed take 50.7 milliseconds. The fall is also slow as well. If I trace along here, it looks like it crosses somewhere around 40 to 50, and we can see from 159 to 95, it takes 44.5 milliseconds. Once we switch over to the premium overdrive, we introduce overshoot, and overshoot does make the first responses faster. Looking at my first response here, it's somewhere less than 10 milliseconds, and we can see that it's 8.7 milliseconds. That's pretty good. For the fall, we're going to undershoot now, but it does reach its target level pretty quickly, about 11.7 milliseconds. Now let's switch over to the real response. What I'm measuring here is how long it takes for the response to finally and fully reach its target level. Looking at the premium overdrive, we do reach fairly quickly, but we overshoot. As we come back down, we finally reach the target level a little bit below 30 milliseconds. That response is 28.3 milliseconds. The same thing occurs with the fall. As I go down, we reach at a little past 10, but the final result levels at a little past 20, which is 22.9. Let's now take a look at the cumulative absolute deviation. Looking at the premium overdrive setting, even though it does overshoot, it spends less time and a distance away from the target response, which means it gets a lower CAD score. 357.2 versus 580.4. While I'm still on this slide, there's one premium transition that kind of caught my eye. It's a bit hard to see, but the transition from 0 to 127 has a CAD of 1000. We should take a look at that. Wow. If you look at the right, I changed the scale of the CAD graph to a broader 0 to 1000 to better illustrate just how bad some of these transitions are. Looking at our 0 to 127, we still see that same 1000. And we can see that this transition dramatically overshoots before it hits 16.6 .6 milliseconds, which is a full frame at 60 hertz. Then the panel dries back down towards its target level. It takes a long time and it spends a long way away from the target level, giving us this high CAD score. Looking at the high overdrive setting, it's not as bad. We still have a CAD of 715, which shows that the BenQ takes a long, slow ramp to 127. But it is slightly better than this nonsense. There's one final transition I want to look at, and you can see it in the bottom right of the CAD graph. The transition from white to 255 to 223 has a CAD of 1400. I have got to know what's happening here. The initial fall here occurs quite rapidly. It only takes about 2.1 milliseconds to reach 223, but it sails well past that. Once it reaches 16.6 .6 milliseconds, one frame at 60 hertz, the panel can now drive back up towards the target level. As we move along, we hit 33 milliseconds, two frames, and we're about at the target level, but we still need a bit longer, three full frames. Look at the area in that chasm that's why the CAD is so high, and why the first response can be a very misleading metric. This is a bit of a pick-your-poison situation. Premium does better overall, but both it and high are astonishingly bad. So how do these slow transitions actually look? In my previous reviews, I've been using footage of the Gaia 3D star map to show how slow transitions can temporarily dim the screen. And the BenQ does poorly here, unsurprisingly. I even called this the Skyrim on a VA panel test, but... I should probably just show some Skyrim on this VA panel. Snowy trees show this off great. 
As I pan around, all detail in the trees disappears until I stop moving the camera. But it doesn't just happen here. Same situation in caves, caverns, Dwemer ruins. Skyrim was made for CRT and OLED. Now that was a lot said about a monitor most of you aren't going to care about, but as holiday shopping is coming up, and I don't have any high refresh VA panel monitors to review, I wanted to at least add in some sort of VA panel to my fledgling review channel. You'll probably see more deals on 144Hz QHD VA monitors than for any other type this holiday, so I wanted to put this up as a bit of a caution. All current LCDs are compromises, but VAs do only one thing well, contrast. I know I'll be sticking with IPS and TN. But I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments, and especially from people who have owned IPS, VA, and TN. What are you willing to accept in a monitor? Or do you just need two different monitors for two different purposes? As always, if you care to look, all the results for this BenQ are up on ApertureGrill.com. Thanks for watching.